Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the University of Michigan for this webinar titled Age of Innovation, Research Universities and Commercialization. My name is David Thompson, and I'm the University of Michigan's lead fundraiser for its Office of Research. The University of Michigan currently is the number one public research university in the country with over $1.6 billion in research throughput. One of the serious questions all research institutions are facing today is how does research turn into or translate into tangible societal value? A significant part of the answer to that question at major research universities and the University of Michigan not accepted is in the effectiveness of its research translation and commercialization office. That office at Michigan is called the Office of Technology Transfer. Today, we will hear from the Associate Vice President for Research, Technology Transfer, and Innovation Partnerships, Dr. Kelly Sexton, and her guests as they discuss the University of Michigan's new initiatives and activities designed to accelerate the commercialization of its research discoveries and to catalyze new startup success in this age of innovation. Dr. Sexton, thank you for joining us. Hi, David, and thank you for that great introduction. And thank you, everybody, for joining us for um, this afternoon's event. Um, so I'm really excited for the opportunity to share with you all some of the initiatives we have underway at U of M to accelerate the commercialization of our research discoveries and catalyze startup success. At U of M Tech Transfer, we have a simple mission statement, and it's that we are inspired to redefine how world-class university research can fuel a region and solve the world's greatest challenges. And I wanna start by talking a bit about what it is that makes University of Michigan so uniquely special when it comes to innovation. So first, we're huge. And with nearly 100 programs ranking in the top 10 nationwide, we, have, we are one of the finest universities in the world. And this excellence translates into strengths in medicine, engineering, the humanities, public health, design, business, information, law, social work, and beyond. And when you take this research infrastructure and you fuel it with the $1.6 billion in research activity that occurs on our campus every year, you create an environment with an unparalleled capacity for creative innovation. Now, in order for society to realize all of the benefits of the amazing research occurring at the U of M, we have to invest the time and energy to move these innovations out into the world. An important way we do this is by transferring these innovations to the entrepreneurs and the businesses, large and small, that can take these innovations and take them from idea to life-saving therapeutic, medical device, the new technologies that enhance societal well-being and improve lives. This process of taking these research discoveries and patenting them um, and protecting them through copyright, then licensing them and transferring them to companies, all of this is collectively referred to as technology transfer. And because that takes too much time to say, the short version is that at U of M Tech Transfer, it's our job to make sure that every U of M research discovery has its very best opportunity to change the world. And we have a long and successful history of moving and developing innovations that move and improve our world. Um, with, from ranging from startup companies like May Mobility that seeks to transform cities with autonomous technology to create a safer, greener, and more accessible world, to the interlaced laser-powered LASIK technology that has given the gift of clear vision to over 11 million patients around the world. U of M's startup Arbor Networks was founded two decades ago to provide network security services, and their success has solidified Ann Arbor's position as a cybersecurity hub. U of M has one of the nation's largest academic drug discovery pipelines with 130 projects in the research phase across our campus and 14 licensed therapeutics currently in the FDA clinical pipeline. U of M engineers 
um, developed the world's smallest computer, the Michigan Micromote. And it's being the resulting startup, CubeWorks, is taking this technology and bringing it out into the world, redefining ultra low power microcomputing. U of M research created the field of histotripsy, which is a way to use pulse sound waves to target and destroy tissue. This non invasive technology has the potential to revolutionize the way many diseases are treated and is being brought to the clinic by U of M startup, Histosonics. U of M engineers dreamed of a world where every device is smart and connected, and U of M startup company Mythic AI is bringing that vision to reality with their integrated hardware and software platform. And finally, U of M law professor JJ Prescott saw that our court system lacked innovation, and he decided to develop a solution to make courts more accessible. For his work, JJ is this year's recipient of the University of Michigan Distinguished University Innovator of the Year Award. We will hear more about the impact of court innovations in just a bit from MJ Cartwright, the CEO leading this company. So we have a strong history of tech transfer and we're only getting better. In fact, we consistently rank among the top universities in the country for research commercialization. In terms of innovations developed on our campus, we rank number three in the country behind only MIT and Stanford. For US patents issued, we rank number four. And commercialization agreements, which are the contracts by which we move the, this intellectual property out in the world, we come in at number five. And with our startups, we're seeing an even more dramatic increase and jumping from 23rd in the country to seventh in just two years. And I'm pleased to share that even despite the uncertainty of recent months, we just closed fiscal year 20 with a record breaking 31 new startup companies. And already in this new fiscal year, we're at five. So we're on pace to continue this um, significant momentum of startup company creation. Now I want to take just a moment and talk about this slide and at U of M Tech Transfer, we have a tradition of inviting startup founders to come into our office. This is now moved online, ring the startup bell and tell us about their vision for the company. Now, clearly this photo was taken some months ago because we were in the office and we weren't wearing masks, but the company in this photo is LinksDX and it's a U of M startup company that was launched based on research at the Rogel Cancer Center. And their vision was to create a diagnostic test to help patients understand their risk for prostate cancer. Well, a lot changed in the world since the day that bell was rung earlier this spring. And uh, LinksDX saw the need for COVID testing in our community and decided to use their technical and business capacity to provide saliva-based COVID testing for nursing homes around our state. And just last week, the U of M Board of Regents approved having LinksDX provide the greatly needed additional testing capacity for our campus to help keep our campus community safe as we work to deliver on our mission of providing outstanding education and research as best as possible in the face of this pandemic. And to me, this story illustrates why startup companies are so important. They bring new technologies into the world, they create jobs, they generate economic opportunity, and when they remain in our region, they also create resilient and innovative infrastructure that benefits us all. So what does it take to augment our innovation ecosystem and supercharge our startup efforts? One of the keys to our future success lies in our ability to increase the availability of capital for U of M startups. Now, we all know um, that venture capital, which is the fuel that startup companies need to grow and scale their business, tends to be clustered on the coast. In fact, just three states, California, Massachusetts, and New York, account for 75% of all venture capital dollars invested in startups in our country. And so what this means for our region is that for a startup company founded in the Great Lakes region, it will take on average two years longer to raise their first $500,000 in funding as compared to a startup company on the coast. 
And this challenging situation does result in us losing some really promising U of M startup companies who choose to leave our region for more investment rich environments. And while we can't solve the capital problem single handedly for our region, we have a hypothesis that if we can provide patient risk tolerant capital to the most promising tech transfer startups, we can help them to de-risk their business, making them more attractive to both local and national investors, decreasing the friction and accelerating their success. And that is the premise behind the Accelerate Blue Fund, which is an early stage startup fund for promising University of Michigan tech focused startup companies. The Accelerate Blue Fund was launched in October of 2019, and we have a near term goal of raising a $2 million first close through philanthropy. Now, the reason we're raising this through philanthropy is because it allows us to create what we hope will become an evergreen source of funding for University of Michigan startups for decades into the future. And it allows us to use the existing tech transfer infrastructure that we have in place. For Accelerate Blue portfolio companies, whenever they have a successful exit, all of the returns will flow back into the Accelerate Blue Fund to facilitate future investments. And it is never easy to raise a first fund, and the pandemic has certainly created challenges um, for us in this effort. But I continue to believe that now is the time to lean in to support the U of M startup pipeline. And I'm pleased to share that many friends and alums of the university agree with this premise. And we have actually raised over $1.1 million in funding for Accelerate Blue. And I wanna thank the generosity of University of Michigan alums, friends at the university, as well as Amazon Web Services for making donations to help us um, pass this halfway mark to reaching our first close. And I wanna emphasize that Accelerate Blue is just one component of our commitment to preeminence in university research commercialization. And so with that, it is my pleasure to invite MJ Cartwright to tell you about her experience launching and leading a U of M startup. MJ Cartwright is the CEO of Court Innovations. She has led and built the team to take the Matterhorn online dispute resolution platform from an academic idea um, to the success it's enjoying today. MJ has an MBA from Eastern Michigan University and a BSEE from U of M. She has started, led, and worked for various technology companies in her career, including several other successful U of M startups, including Health Media and Machine Vision International. MJ, welcome. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, really appreciate being here uh, to highlight uh, Court Innovations, um, also known uh, by our products uh, platform Matterhorn, and really highlight our partnership that we have with the University of Michigan. Uh, and that started uh, back in um, 2014, it seems like uh, a while ago. Um, if we go to the, the first slide, one of the stories that we really like to talk about is why we started this in the first place. And if you had the opportunity to listen to JJ Prescott really talk about receiving his award, the whole thing was around how do we help people reach out to deal with their obligation that they have with their court, particularly, but other obligations that keep them from living their lives. And oftentimes it's very simple. They don't have uh, the, the money to get to court. They're scared to ask. And these are the types of things we really wanted to, to look at at the onset. And who really knew that, at least at that point in time, that health concerns would be an issue and the courts would indeed be closing down as far as their physical building and uh, they would have to access their courts online. And so that's really the reason, uh, and the next slide is to why we created uh, Court Innovations and Matterhorn, is we really appreciate what the courts and the judicial system do, but we really do not have the ability to um, uh, handle everything within the court process. So if we, yeah, let's stop right there. And there must be some auto thing going on here. 
Um, but how, you know, how did we get started? And, you know, we started uh, with the idea coming from the University of Michigan Law School. And this was an idea with J.J. Prescott, uh, the professor, and one of his um, you know, brilliant students. Uh, how, do we, how do we do this? How do we help these people? And they got with the Technology Transfer Center, uh, not only for several ways to look to explore this, do discovery, but also to look to someone to help them run the business. And uh, I, the timing was great, and I was involved um, working with various uh, mentors and staff there and spent time with JJ and the team and really start, saw the need that was there. So if you can imagine at a point in time when, you know, who wants to go into the government space? Who wants to go into the court space? Think in terms of long sales cycles, an industry that doesn't want to move very quickly. And at the same time, there was a need out there. The timing seemed to be right. There seemed to be interest. And the Michigan Supreme Court uh, Court Administration Office uh, sent a, a message out to various uh, judges to see if anyone would be interesting, interested in exploring this with us. And there were many takers on this. And there were the, um, in Ann Arbor, uh, the, the first one, as well as out uh, with, uh, in Bay County and in uh, East Lansing, and also in um, Highland Park, Detroit, a very diverse set that we did our initial pilots with to see if this made sense. And also with the tech transfer office, we were able to work uh, as an incubator in their um, venture center because you know we didn't have the funds to allocate for an office space at that time. So it was a great base for us to get going, explore the pilots with the different courts, really see if there was um, a market here for us. And then also, and we've actually been doing this on a continual basis, work with other parts of the University of Michigan, uh, the business school on some of the uh, market expansions and product expansions that we're looking at. Also with the University of Michigan School of Information on, on user experience projects and making sure that we are addressing some of the important aspects of how people interact with our system accessibility and things along those lines. So we've really um, uh, uh, an ongoing strong relationship with the University of Michigan. And what, what, is, what is it we've been able to do? And if we look at the next slide, we've been able to expand from something very simple as handling online a, a traffic ticket and dealing with your police officer or your law enforcement individual um, uh, pr a pr uh, prosecutor or whomever, and then also getting into the court to address the situation. We started off with those, started off with online pleas. If you have an outstanding warrant obligation, think in terms of, yeah, I'm just going to march into court and deal with my warrant when in fact you can and probably would be thrown in jail if you have an outstanding warrant. How do you deal with this? And as uh, our work expanded, as really the need was getting greater out there and still is, we expanded this into small claims, landlord tenant cases, um, different areas of civil debt, uh, when we think in terms of credit card debt, medical debt, uh, other types of debt. These are the, the types of cases that can and potentially should be handled online. We've also moved into family cases. So think in terms of domestic relations and you have two parties who uh, really need to stay uh, apart from each other when they're working through a divorce or child custody or parenting time agreements before a divorce decree and then also after a divorce decree. And then handling third party mediation um, when you really need to come to a, a resolution and you need some guidance in doing so, this could be court ordered this could be pre-filing into the court. Uh, all of these things are, are pretty important. And with COVID-19, you know, we never thought that we would see full um, um, arraignment for misdemeanors um, and uh, case resolution, adjudication of misdemeanors online for criminal cases. And we're seeing that now done through our system. So we really, um, you know, continue to, be, to do this expansion over time and really have a great impact. And as we look at where we have this impact, uh, we'll see that you know we started in Michigan, we started in Washtenaw County on this next slide, 
you'll see how we have expanded across the state. And um, mostly, you know, starting from the southeastern sector and moving up upwards as we move uh, across Michigan and really meeting the needs of uh, the Michigan court system as we do so, whether it is in the um, criminal court cases, the civil court cases, or in those family courts uh, across the state. And then as we look in at, at a national picture in the next slide, this is where we really start to see the impact of, uh, we're currently now have um, signed contracts with 17 states across the US I'm hoping at this point tomorrow, I can say we'll be over 20. We really have a great momentum uh, to address a great need that is out there. And as we look at impact on the next couple slides here, um, being able to handle the infrastructure and build the scalability to do what we're doing today took a lot of foresight that we really had to handle way back at the very beginning. And how do we put together um, um, the intellectual property, what can and, 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 and cannot be viewed as intellectual property. Once again, building up that scaling was something that we did with the tech transfer office. And we look at now, we have over 110,000 cases that we have done, and this number is growing very quickly, and it's actually over that now. So I always like to you know, make sure our numbers are beefy and now our numbers are starting to, um, my slides are, are not really caught up with our numbers. And as we look at some very specific impact, societal impact and community impact on this next uh, slide, we will see that when we talk to people who have not been able to deal with the court system, 40% of the people, um, it's been 39 and it's been ratcheting up with COVID-19, this is an astonishing number that this many people would not have been able to handle their case online if it wasn't for the technology Matterhorn that we're um, dealing with today. And as we look at savings, um, think in terms of just court savings alone being 80% of, of time savings for the court staff, over 90% of payments being paid off, cases closed, and people can move on with their lives uh, in, in 30 days. And th these are numbers that really have not been seen in the court system for uh, decades. And then we really always look at, all right, are we building a system that can really drive um, people to come to it? I mean, you want people to recommend it and we're finding that to be true. You want people to feel that their case was handled fairly. Very tough question to ask, but a very important question to ask. And we are finding that people are answering this in a very positive way. Even those people who don't really like the outcome of their case, but they do feel that it was uh, fair, um, fair in how it was being handled. If we look at the next slide of outcomes, there's a, there's a couple here that really impact family. And you think of families going through um, what we're going through right now and um, you know, children who are um, in, um, uh, divorce situations and in multi multiple homes and how child support needs to work and and how you'd share parenting client time that's a little bit different than it used to be um, how do you handle school which is clearly different than it used to be um, we're finding that uh, be because of having an online platform we're having more child support being collected for for these families and the children which is uh, quite significant. It's also significant that the federal dollars can come in and, and as that number goes up on state child support, federal dollars can come in and help. Also having less hearings, bringing the families together to have less hearings in front of the judge, um, I mean, over, you know, almost 30% less hearings and judges are even saying that it seems like it's 50% because we really can focus on those serious cases that are out there. And then, you know, last, um, but definitely not least, if you're not issuing warrants in your community, uh, this is a huge a cost savings to the community. And to cut down on those warrants uh, by over 30% uh, is, is really, really significant. And these are numbers that are over a three year time frame that we've been working. And the numbers I showed on the last slide were over uh, a six year time frame. So there's really significant data that's really proving that this is the right time for this type of technology. As we look at um, the, the next slide, 
and we can see what this really means to the people that we're working with. And this is significant. So if you can imagine our team and our team to, uh, as we work today, we have a Monday morning huddle. We get together all, uh, uh, all in our homes and we do get together periodically in the office uh, safely. But when we are in our homes working away, we go right to looking at these impact um, statements. What, what are people saying? What impact are we having? What difference are we making in their lives? And I wanna point out just a few things here because to know that you have this ability during a pandemic, we're getting incredible feedback um, on that. The other is there's um, a lot of discussion that uh, senior citizens and, and the older population uh, aren't able to deal with technology. And in fact, what we're finding is that um, the older population, they aren't as mobile and having the technology available for them in particular has been very helpful for them to resolve their case and um, really move forward with their lives. So that's kind of an overview of, of Matterhorn, what we've been able to do and starting from those really, really um, uh, early days of growing the business with the Office of Technology Transfer and quite frankly, still working with the Office of Technology Transfer at the University of Michigan. Wonderful, thank you, MJ. Um, so now I would like to um, invite to join us Mike Sarathakis, Director of the Venture Center and um, also Managing Director of the Accelerate Blue Fund. Mike brings over 30 years of entrepreneurial, senior management, and venture fund experience in both the public and private sectors. Before joining U of M, he was the Vice President of Business Acceleration at the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, where he oversaw a $250 million portfolio of investments in over 150 early stage tech companies. Before that, he was an assistant vice president in Forest Health Services, where he managed a $50 million corporate venture fund that focused on life sciences, IT, and manufacturing opportunities. Hi, Mike. Welcome. Hi, Kelly. It's great to be here. Great. Um, so, Mike, um, thanks for joining us. Can you tell us a bit about the organization of the Venture Center and how your team supports the launch of U of M startups? and also give us a sense of the size of the University of Michigan startup pipeline. Sure, thanks. Um, so the, the Venture Center in close coll collaboration with the Tech Transfer Licensing Team supports research projects from all three University of Michigan campuses in Ann Arbor, Flint, and Dearborn that have the potential to be commercialized via a new startup opportunity. We also, as MJ just mentioned, uh, provide support for these startups as they spin out of the university to help the companies with their talent needs, customer discovery and market strategies, and uh, as they plan to secure investment capital. Uh, regarding new investment capital, we do make a significant effort to connect our work in U of M startups with angel investors, venture capital firms, and strategic partners here in Michigan, as well as across the country and we also have a Venture Accelerator, which is an incubator that provides world-class lab and office space next to the tech transfer offices and is dedicated solely to U of M licensed startups. And as with startups, it's, it's really about the team. And we are incredibly fortunate to have a team with experience in starting and growing companies as well as making and managing investments. Beyond myself, the Venture Center team includes two experienced entrepreneurs, Chuck Cole, for physical sciences and Dave Rep for life sciences. Uh, Diane Buis, manager of our Venture Accelerator and also manages our talent recruitment effort. And very importantly, we have an 11 person in-house team of mentors and residents that have been part, that have been part or, of some of the most successful startups ever built in Michigan. And the reason we need a team of the size is we typically have a pipeline of 150 to 175 startup projects as well as 20 to 30 launched startups that we are directly working with. Great, thanks for that overview. I'd like to invite MJ to come back and join us for this discussion. There you are, welcome back. Um, so MJ, thanks for your um, presentation and, and the overview of, of Cord Innovations and the great work that you're doing and you know the, the impact that you're having. 
I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the early days of when you first learned about the Court Innovations Project um, and, you know, any advice you'd give to an entrepreneur like yourself that's looking for their next big idea. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I've uh, been fortunate enough to be working with um, U of M on various um, companies and technologies over the years. And so, you know, for me, it was um, um, working that network. And I think that's an important aspect for others is leveraging the, the network that uh, U of M has and especially the tech transfer office. Uh, there's a lot of talent that is rotating in and out of there when Mike uh, mentioned um, different, the, the staff of mentors. Uh, I mean, at any given time, there's gonna be one or two mentors that uh, is, has a connection with the industry uh, or the types of companies that you need to be talking to. And uh, also, if that isn't there, they know the, the bigger network in which to, to work with. So, so that is um, something that was really true with me and that would be something that I would advise others as they, they move forward. And you know, also making, you know, leveraging the fact that these guys know how to do this whole process uh, and the whole discovery process up front. Uh, you know, you, you have to make, not sh make sure that you not only have a good idea, but you actually have a good idea that the world needs, right? And there is a, a process for going through that that is pretty important. And then, um, you know, for us, as, as we're going through that process, when we were doing this with uh, Matterhorn, it was leveraging the incubator and a lot of those resources that are there uh, were just really at, at our, our fingertips as we're working through that long haul of figuring it out, um, having a, a team is uh, critically important. So yes, I, re I remember those days incredibly well, especially those early days. Thanks, MJ. So, Mike, then to you, it, it's clear that University of Michigan hit the lottery when we connected MJ with Court Innovations, and, and that's just, you know, been a, a really, you know, successful for both parties venture. Um, can you talk a bit about how your team goes about finding other great entrepreneurs and connecting them with projects in the hopes that they'll one day become a startup? Sure, um, and you're right. Um, you know, MJ and Quarter Innovation is one of uh, my favorite success stories, even though they started their effort uh, before I was able to join U of M. And, you know, finding good business talent like MJ to join a technical startup team is typically um, one of the most challenging aspects uh, for our startups when, when they launch. Um, we have incredible technical and research talent at the university, but uh, most faculty and graduate students who are involved with the startup don't have uh, significant business experience. Um, and as a result, uh, the team really makes a major effort to support new companies to help them fill out the business side of the team. And, as, and so we, we're constantly on the lookout for people that might be interested in a new opportunity uh, and that that opportunity fits their background. Um, we're very fortunate to have Diane on, as part of the team and she takes a leadership role in that effort now. And we, we all occasionally also have one of our mentors um, will leave and start a, a new um, U of M, uh, lead a new U of M startup. And so there's a double benefit in searching for business talent because uh, as we lose members from our team when they go and, and launch a successful U of M startup, we need to fill that role. And those are the kind of people we're looking for. Yeah, great. So MJ, you've known tech transfer for quite some time. Um, in your view, what's changed the most in our organization over the years? And what should we be focusing on to, to try to improve and, and get better in the years ahead? Yeah, well, I can't help but dating, date myself on, on that one. Uh, because there's been a lot of really great uh, technologies um, that have, have come forward. And, and I, I do want to add to what um, uh, Mike had commented on, because one of the things when you're actually finding a combination of um, leadership and talent that works is uh, I, I don't think you could have, um, speaking personally, a founder, an innovator, like, like I was able to work with JJ Prescott, because oftentimes you'll get, um, you, you don't get that synergy, right? And to have that synergy happen, 
where, you know, leveraging the brilliance of a professor at university who really wants to continue to be a professor, but really do more with innovation at the same time uh, was, you know, um, this has been a privilege uh, because that doesn't always work that way. I mean, that, that alone is, is um, uh, pretty, pretty difficult to pull off and you guys have experience with that, which, you know, really leads me to how things have changed. I mean, you know, I, I believe that the entire tech transfer team has, has a much better understanding of the whole innovation process. And the way you actually get that understanding is by doing it, right? And you have been out there doing it and you think about that growth curve, Kelly, that you showed earlier back when, you know, 2014 was what, maybe 10, 12 companies. And now you're uh, over 30 companies uh, on an annual basis. This is, you're out there doing it, right? you are um, moving things forward. And if you don't get things out in the marketplace and see how they work, uh, you're, you're not gonna know. And so that is um, you know, what, one of the changes that I've seen over the years uh, in working. And also that, um, as I spoke to earlier, that increasing network of expertise and that you have rotating through um, the university and in particular the tech transfer office because that is, um, so important to plug into that network because that is where um, you you have to realize that you're not alone in this and that you really can leverage best of breed out there and if you're not doing that you're not doing a, a justice or a service to those that you are working with and, and supporting um, as you move forward and in, in the and really i was so excited about this accelerate blue fund because one of the biggest issues that uh, startups have, once you get a momentum going, you get the discovery, you start to get excite excitement and you need capital, but you aren't at that point where you are totally um, um, profitable. And so where, where is that early seed funding gonna come from? And so looking at um, how this fund is gonna operate, it fills an incredible void that's out there for the University of Michigan Technologies. I mean. I would have loved to have something like this uh, in the early days of um, Core Innovations at Matterhorn. Yeah, well, that was my next question for you: was was fundraising a challenge for you in the early days? And you know, how would you you know describe the general climate for early stage you know tech startups like Core Innovations? Yeah, you know, it, it you know uh, getting capital is always you know um, uh, for new technologies. Uh, a challenge and you know with COVID-19 you know you, you see that the funds you know really you know doing which I think is the right thing focusing on their current portfolio and making sure that they're supported as they move forward but that does leave less capital uh, for the startups and the pre-seed uh, fund so when we you know were moving forward we we had to be creative in our funding um, there the Accelerate Blue fund wasn't there and so, you know, we were, were, you know, going about our series A of, of getting investors, getting impact investors and impact funds to look at us, as well as some equity crowdsourcing. So we have been very creative in our funding to get us to that next stage of having enough capital to make the impact that we need to have out there. Yeah. So you, you mentioned how investors now are um, focusing on their existing portfolios. So question to Mike, um, is Accelerate Blue still relevant right now? What are your thoughts about the need for it? No, it's not relevant at all, no. <laughs> Sorry, I have to say that. Um, no, Accelerate Blue, um, you know, in the time uh, of what's going on in the world with, with COVID-19, I think is, is even more relevant. Uh, as MJ said, early stage funding is, is always challenging. Um, and most investors and venture firms have become more conservative in looking at new startup investments and rightly so, so they can support their current portfolios because the future is uncertain. So as a result for the time being and likely, likely even after COVID, um, high risk patient capital will become even more scarce than it was before. And you know, as you mentioned earlier, Kelly, Accelerate Blue Fund can't solve the funding challenge for all startups in Michigan, but the fund can hydrel, um, help address this issue for uh, U of M startups that we help spin out. 
you know, and that's, that's really why we're so excited to have recently passed the million dollar mark uh, that you mentioned um, in the previous panel in our fundraising efforts, even during these challenging times, because it's really an endorsement uh, of, of what we're trying to do. Great, thank you. Well, I'd like to ask our colleague David Thompson to, to rejoin us um, and maybe bring us some questions from the audience. Hi, David. Hi, Kelly. Um, great conversation uh, and nice to be with each of you. I just want to take a moment. Several of you have um, provided some questions uh, to the panelists and I'm going to try to um, curate those and, and ask a few of those questions. Uh, of each person. Uh, this question is for Mike. Uh, it's from an alumnus and an investor. And the question is, how can I learn more about University of Michigan startups? So this is one of my favorite questions. Um, so first of all, uh, myself and, and the team, we're happy to meet with any investor that may have an interest in U of M startups. So please uh, feel free to go to our website uh, and, and contact us. Uh, I believe there's going to be a follow-up email to this presentation, uh, so you'll have some contact information in there, and we're happy to have a discussion. Um, one of the tools we use to communicate um, our pipeline, which is quite robust, is a quarterly re report that is creatively called the Quarterly Pipeline Report um, that provides a high-level overview of all the projects we're working on as well as U of M startups that are actively fundraising and have given us their permission to include them in the report. Uh, we have found this to be a great way to open a discussion. Um, and in fact, uh, I believe six companies have secured venture capital as a result of the introduction of this report. And the report is just a hook. Um, if you see something of interest, uh, we're happy to send you additional information, get you in front of the team, and engage um, to help that happen as easily as possible. Great, thank you. Outside of uh, funding, another pan, uh, attendee asked, what is one of the biggest challenges research universities are faced with when it comes to commercialization? Now, I'll, I'll take just a, a minute on that one, um, but you know, others can jump in. So. Um, one of the challenges we face is that, you know, faculty are interested in pushing, you know, the boundaries of knowledge typically. So the discoveries that we get into the office are typically very early stage. Um, and because our faculty are all, also going to publish their results, we have to make patent filing decisions quite early as well. Um, so it's always a challenge to, to be able to take that early stage innovation and advance it to the point or we could even show it to an, an MJ or to another entrepreneur or market it to, a, to an existing business. And I'll say at U of M, we're really fortunate to have a lot of translational research funding programs to help us bridge that gap. Um, we recently announced the creation of the Frankel Innovation Fund, thanks to the generosity of a donor to the university um, on the health sciences side. Also in the state of Michigan, um, statewide, we have um, programs funded by the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, MTREC programs, which we have um, at, uh, transportation and we have uh, uh, life sciences on our campus. There's also um, advanced computing and ag biotech. And all of these together help all of the universities in our state have this opportunity to advance their most promising technologies towards license. So, so that's one of the biggest issues that I see. And I think we've done a really good job in the region. And I think the programs we've developed should be the envy of most other states. And I, I'd like to jump in there too. Um, you know, the, what the MEDC does for us, um, and they also support our, you know, our, our mentor program, the T3N program is called, um, they support that program statewide at every university. Um, as well as seed fund initiatives across the state. So it is, it is I talk to universities around the country constantly, um, at tech transfer and, and new venture groups. And without exception, they are astounded at the support we receive from the state. And it, it's, we get that because of the challenges we're, we're dealing with uh, being in the middle of the country and not having the resources that the coasts have. So 
um, you know, and, and those things help with funding and talent. Uh, and the real challenges that, you know, uh, MJ has, has articulated uh, in growing court innovations. Mike, we have a real quick question on the pipeline report. Just the yeah. question is um, how to receive it. Um, so uh, we need to meet with people uh, before we put them on the list just to make sure they're qualified because uh, Michigan typically does have a small piece of equity in the startups that we're supporting. And so we have to follow SEC guidelines. So please reach out in the follow-up email that will come after this. And we're happy to set, a, set up a quick Zoom call and have a discussion and then get you on the pipeline report. And we'll send you our latest one after that discussion. And, and by qualified, we mean accredited investor, right? Yes, yeah. thank you. Yep, send Mike an this email. Is a, <laughs> this is a question for MJ. Uh, did the COVID-19 pandemic lead to an increase in competition for court innovation? And how will you maintain your market share? That's, uh, it's a good question. And we are seeing um, uh, other companies and other ideas come up, but the need is so great. I mean, it's so great that um, even our company with uh, increases in um, uh, the staff and the teams across the country, we can't keep up with it. So it's obviously when, where there's need, there will be uh, other competition. So yes, uh, we're paying very close attention to that. Um, having a head start uh, clearly is um, a position for us, but always making sure that we innovate and really talking to the right people and making sure that we're at the forefront of those next steps is uh, definitely what is um, part of our day-to-day uh, -day activity here. So it's a great question and the need is only increasing out there. Thank you. Um, so there, there's several questions um, about the University of Michigan entrepreneurial ecosystem. And so I wonder, um, Kelly, if maybe you could sort of in broad strokes frame where the Office of Technology Transfer sits in the ecosystem. Sure, and I, I, I sometimes describe it as there's uh, essentially two um, entrepreneurial ecosystems on campus. You have the student um, entrepreneurial programming and um, the University of Michigan absolutely excels at that. In 2018, we were ranked the number one university for undergraduate entrepreneurial programming. And that is largely decentralized. It occurs at the colleges, which makes perfect sense because that's where the courses occur. Um, and across campus, we do have an entrepreneurship minor um, that is offered. Our um, tech transfer sits on the other side, which is the research enterprise side of the University of Michigan. And so our, we primarily interface with faculty, staff, and graduate students. And that's where we sit. So it's, it's really for us, everything starts with the research discoveries that are generated by that $1.6 billion in activity. And I, I saw a question from that was put in, are there undergraduate pitch competitions at the U of M? And oh my gosh, yes, there are <laughs> undergraduate pitch competitions at U of M. And we have a really vibrant undergrad startup scene and a really vibrant tech transfer startup scene. There is intersections between the two, um, but you know, we're, we're focused on the research side. Thank you. Um, just just in terms of um, spinning out a startup, what's the typical timeline for a startup? Well, that's, that's a, a tough question because we represent um, all 19 schools. So spinning out a startup based on a therapeutic um, or a startup based on uh, having an impact in the legal field or a startup in network security are, are very different things. Uh, the beauty of what we do at the office is that it's not a cookie cutter. Um, and so we can provide essentially a, a, a service that, that accelerates, but also incubates that project so that when it's the right time to launch, we'll launch them. And, and that can be a decade. We, we just signed a license with a company. Um, I don't know if we can talk about it publicly yet, but, but three directors before me worked, worked on that project. So we're really excited to see that finally transpire and it's in the materials and energy space. So it's, um, 
you know, we don't have a typical and, and honestly, we don't want to have a typical. Obviously, software startups, for example, uh, typically spin out faster than uh, hard sciences like, you know, therapeutics or medical device or hard engineering, you know, uh, projects. For those that might be um, sort of new to technology transfer, can you just walk us through, Mike, a little bit of the decision making process between license versus startup and some of the basic mechanics of each? Sure. So, you know, it, it touches on many of the things that we've discussed previously. Um, it, it's about building uh, the tech, getting the technology within the research enterprise to a stage where commercialization makes sense. And then the exploring the opportunity and often by taking advantage of these great programs that we've already talked about inside the university to do customer discovery and market discovery uh, and federal programs where um, our engineering school oversees something called i -Corps, where you're talking to 100 potential customers and saying, is there a there there? Uh, and then uh, as we spoke previously, building the teams around that and, and putting in the the right plans for funding, go to market, et cetera. But often times, one of those projects, and we don't launch all the projects that I've talked about in our pipeline as startups, oftentimes we discover in the process that it, uh, a better path is to license to industry or, or potentially to open source a discovery because there's really not a, 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 a way we can commercialize it uh, for a variety of reasons. And, and sometimes, you know, it's like, you know, there's just, not a lot of traction there. So let's save everybody time and do some publications, if that makes sense, to get the word out on the, on the work that's been done and, and go back to the drawing board uh, and work on another project if the faculty member and the grad teams have interest in you know, exploring another opportunity. Kelly, um, someone has asked um, why the University of Michigan is lagging compared to its coastal peers um, and scale and impact of its commercialization efforts. Yeah, I'm going to assume they put in that question before they saw my presentation. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, the answer is we're not lagging. We're competing with the very best universities in the country in this, in this effort. Um, University of Michigan faculty in the research community um, you know, are putting forth an incredible number of innovations and we've built over the years a really strong infrastructure to support them. Great translational research funding programs and great connections like the mentor in residence program that that Mike runs. Um, and all of these things are really coming together and, and helping us to accelerate. I think the areas where, you know, there's a gap is around funding for early stage startup companies. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, we're making great strides and, uh, you know, addressing that gap. And I think we're going to continue to launch great programs like that to try to address it and, you know, try to compete with the very best. If, if I so, could jump in, so, too. Yeah. Can I jump in just a little bit there? So, so Kelly had a great conversation with the president this morning. And one of the things he talked about was the, the, the cultural shift in universities, not just at U of M, but across the country in regard to embracing that commercialization of research is one of the most viable paths to getting the, the work we do at the university out to impact society. And, and honestly, the university historically hasn't embraced that in a proactive outward looking way, uh, especially, um, you know, most universities didn't as, as as tech transfer offices were formed uh, back in the early 80s. Um, there has been a shift at the University of Michigan for sure in embracing this and also being much more outward facing. So we go to conferences now, uh, hopefully soon again, when uh, that day comes or we're doing them online to engage with investors and engage with strategics and uh, understand what other, other research organizations are doing. And that's we just didn't get the word out, honestly, um, on what we were doing. And we're, we're taking some pride and ownership in that through what the work we do now. So one of the clear um, beneficiaries of a well-oiled office of technology transfer office is society. Um, and listening to you, MJ, um, just clear that technologies applied to the commercialization process can really benefit real people 
um, in our communities, in our state region, and maybe the entire country and world. Um, we have one person that's asked, how does the university benefit, specifically financially? Um, the faculty, the staff, who, who gets the benefits, and how does that work? Yeah, um, great question. And it's one of the great things about working in tech transfer. So the revenue that we generate um, goes two places. One, it goes to inventors to reward them for their efforts and to incentivize them to keep inventing and to engage in what is really an extracurricular activity for them. That is actually mandated by federal law called the Bayh-Dole Act. Congress wanted universities to incentivize their faculty and staff to engage in that activity. The second place it goes is to reinvest in our research and innovation here on campus. Um, and so it's wonderful to be able to generate revenue for the university that goes back in and supports our research enterprise in that way. So every time MJ sends us a check, it goes two <laughs> places, to the creators and inventors, and then also to, to campus to reinvest in research and make us even better for the future. So this, this might be a good last question to end on. Um, in these tumultuous times, do you see the off, foresee the Office of Technology Transfer prioritizing technology transfer knowledge inspired and developed by minority faculty and graduate cohorts? That is a great question. And, you know, one of the things that's really important to us is to ensure that we're giving great examples of, you know, leaders from one, all walks of life, and two, all categories of knowledge and innovation on campus. For us, we were really excited to be able to, to showcase the work of J.J. Prescott in increasing accessibility and access to the judicial system, reducing racial disparities through the process of taking his creative work and moving it out into the world. The fact that it's led by, you know, MJ as a woman entrepreneur is another wonderful piece of that story. So one, I wanna be sure we're recruiting um, ideas from across campus because we're gonna need a diversity of ideas to solve the problems we face. The second thing that's important is understanding where the innovations are coming from and are we doing things in our work um, that are perhaps narrowing that funnel because we need the funnel to be really large. So we're starting to assess for the first time where are our inventions coming from um, in terms of gender and racial background and are there programs, specific targeted programs we can do to increase our outreach to, to women and minority faculty and to encourage them to work with us. So these are things we're measuring and we're gonna be running experiments throughout the coming years because we know that we are really, in essence, a connector between the university and the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And if we can help increase the size of that funnel by connecting with more women and minority entrepreneurs and investors, more women and minority faculty members, we know we can come up with better solutions. So thank you for that question. Thank you, um, Dr. Sexton, Mike, MJ, so much uh, to all the speakers um, and special thanks to the Founders Circle members and all current donors to the Accelerate Blue Fund. And particular thanks to all of you who attended. Thank you so much. If you asked a question, and it wasn't answered, please do feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to speak with you. And keep your eye out on the inbox for an email and other links soon, including slides from this evening and a special message from the Founders Circle Chair, Rob Bronstein. We hope to see you at our next webinar in September. Stay well, stay safe, and thank you again. Go Blue. Thank you.